Hey there, hope you're ready for class number three. Here we are. Tonight I want to talk about how companies are a human endeavor. As I look around and see why people misunderstand companies, misjudge them, uh, predict the wrong things about what they're going to do next, and try to think through, well, why, why do people get it wrong? One of the big reasons, ironically, is that they don't understand that it's a human endeavor. I love dogs. Dogs don't go around starting companies. It's a human thing. We study these companies, you know, we read our Fortune 500s and all that. We look at the numbers, we look at their buildings, their software, their products. All that has a place in all this. But none of that would have happened without people. This is a human construction. And understanding companies means that we have to think about who are the people in the organization? Who are the people at the top leading it and throughout the organization? What do they believe in? How do they really, what's their attitude towards the thing? What's kind of their whole view both of the world and of their enterprise? How do they treat other people? How do they interact with other people? You know, if you're a leader of an organization, you're really kind of at the center of a storm. The current buzzword for all that is stakeholders, but you've got employees employees or associates, you've got customers, you've got suppliers, you've got the community you're in. Um, you have, when I say suppliers, you've got bankers and lawyers and maybe consultants and, you know, so, you know, it's a big world. And the guts, you know, if you go to business school, which is, is a fine thing to do, but a lot of their emphasis is on, um, on marketing, on finance, accounting, information management, really the essence of leadership comes down to sociology and psychology. If you build an enterprise or lead an enterprise, most of what you're going to be doing, the most important stuff you do is selecting people, hiring people, firing people, coaching people, convincing people, nudging people, uh, teaching people, um, it's about people and how you relate to them. And to understand this best, put this one up in advance here, the great management thinker Peter Drucker, I really believe of the non-practitioners, in other words, he never ran a company. Uh, he, he was a professor, an academic, and a consultant. But of all those folks, the one who best understood enterprise and how it really works was Peter Drucker. He wrote a lot of books, and I urge you to read as much as you can get your hands on. And there are some summary books like The Essential Drucker and The Daily Drucker, and those aren't bad. But really, the place to start is this big, big book called Management, Tasks, Responsibilities, Practices. There it is. And if you go to buy it, don't get the updated edition. They did this book's like, I don't know, 30 years old or whatever. Oh, 1973, 35 years, if I counted right. Um, no, older than that. <laughs> Almost 40 years. There you go. And, and don't get the new one because he's dead and people are trying to reorganize what he said. No! Learn it from the horse's mouth. Get this edition. You can still buy it. It's easy to find. Uh, it's a big fat paperback. I think it's around 20, 25 bucks, whatever. Management, task, responsibilities, and practices. It is a big book, unlike the one I uh, suggested last uh, class. It's uh, over 800 pages. Treat it like the Bible for, for business management. Because the thing about Peter Drucker is he understood that it's all about people. He was one of the few people that understood the corporation as a part of a broader society, as a mechanism, as a way of doing things within the bigger picture. That it's, that it's not just about maximizing profit. That it's not just about the shareholders, it's a much bigger, more complex thing. And don't get me wrong, I am not knocking profit and I'm not knocking stockholders. I'm a fervent, free market capitalist kind of guy. But you have to understand how it all fits together. And, and, and examples of where people don't under, and he, and he understood it's about people. 
human beings and ordinary human beings and how they, they can do great things with the right ideas, the right tools, and perhaps most importantly, the right leadership. And, and examples of where people go astray in this, uh, when I was in college, this is oh, way back in uh, medieval times, the 60s and the 70s, and there was an organization called the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, and it was an uh, activist leftist uh, group. And a lot of what they're saying is, we've got to tear down the corporations. The big corporations have ruined our lives, and we've got to stop them, and that was one of many things. And you still hear some people saying that today, I think uh, somewhat fewer than, than did back then. But one of the things, I'd sit there and I'd argue all night, because I love debate and discussion, I'd argue all night with my buddies who were SDSers from the opposite view of the world from, from me on these issues anyway, and you know, they'd be saying, oh, but the corporation is evil and the corporation is out to rip us all off, and, and I'm like, well, who is the corporation? What do you mean? Well, the corporation. I said, well, isn't the corporation your dad or your neighbor's dad? Back then, it wasn't many moms. That's changed a lot, thank heavens. But Back then, it was dads, and you know, and, and they'd say, "Well, what do you mean? What do you mean?" So, well, look, go, go, look at your house. Go down the street, or, or, or the guy down the hall in the college dormitory, his dad, or her dad, you know, and now their moms, you know, and they just. They're never, even the enemies of corporations are never going to be good enemies, uh, effective enemies, <laughs> if they don't understand it's just people. And yes, there are crooks, yes, there are stupid ones, yes, there are smart ones, they're just people. Another example where we miss this, I go to so many websites, even some of the most interesting websites, and there's no people on them. You go to see who's the leadership. There's no pictures of the founders or the group that's running the company. Uh, ideally, there'd be pictures with them and their kids or their dogs or something to make it more human. A big challenge, especially with the rise of the internet, is how do you humanize all this? I've even found a, uh, found a friend of mine, he sent me, he said, look, I'm thinking about hiring these consultants. It was in the restaurant industry. And he said, look at their website, tell me what you think. I said, look, I don't even live in the same city. I don't know these people. I really can't judge, but sure, I'll take a look at the website. I'll try anything once. Anyway, and, and I look. And, and it's a consulting business, and there's no pictures, no information on the biographies or the backgrounds of the people there. And there's no mention of any of the people. It's just like, oh, we'll double your sales, and we do great things, and we know how to organize, or we know how to design your menu, or whatever it was. And I emailed a guy back, and I said, well, look, I, you got to judge for yourself. It's not my money. It's your money you're spending. I wouldn't even answer these people's phone call. I wouldn't even go back to them. It's my gut reaction. They completely, I mean, come on, it's a consulting business. All you are is a bunch of people giving other people advice, and you aren't even talking about yourselves. Like, what do you do, just jump out of an airplane or fall out of a tree, or you've never been in a restaurant in your life? Or you started pouring out grease pans when you were four and, you know, grew up in the, bad, in the back of Dad's Dairy Queen or whatever. I gotta know something about you. I gotta know where you're coming from. I gotta know where your head's at. And that applies to everybody and everything in business. Most of the great business leaders they're not business people. I, I get so frustrated because I kind of grew up in this, this um, myth, uh, stupidity, that there's like doctors and lawyers and poets and writers and business people. No, there are journalists, there are hoteliers, there are restaurateurs, there are merchants who run stores, there are software engineers, there are filmmakers. You know, Walt Disney could not have built Federal Express. Fred Smith, the guy that built Federal Express, could not have built Apple. Jobs could not have built the Disney Company. These people were focused on things they loved. And it wasn't business. It was overnight delivery. Or it was great consumer electronics products and a whole system designed about it, around it. Or great animation and family experiences at Disneyland. And I don't care what, whether you guys go look at funeral homes or hotels or insurance companies. They're all unique and they're unique people in them. If you look at the greatest companies, they're run by people like that. The Wall Street Journal, owned by the Dow Jones Company, in, in its glory days, it was run by Pulitzer Prize winning writers. People understood the importance of journalism. You study Henry Luce, the guy who created Time Life. He was, a, he was a poet himself, and he was obsessed with good writing, no matter what it took, even if he disagreed with his writers. I want to know leaders where their head's at. I want to understand as much as 
as I can about them. I want to know more about them than shows up in those little short biographies that you'll find that they have to turn into the Securities and Exchange Commission or in the proxy statement if you're trying to study a company. We'll come to that later. Uh, uh, look at the proxy statement and you'll know how much stock they own and how much they get paid, the leaders and the board of, boards of directors of companies. But I want to go more than that in biography. Like recently, uh, J.C. Penney, a great old American retailer, hired a new chief executive officer named Ron Johnson. It's been very controversial. He's making very dramatic changes. But the big thing that you see in the papers is, well, he spent the last 10 years building the Apple stores, which are really the most successful group of retail stores in history. If you look at their numbers, their sales per store, sales per square foot, it's amazing what they've done. Now, they're far from the biggest. That's Walmart these days, and before that was Sears, and before that it was a great A&P, Atlantic, Great Atlantic Pacific Tea Company, a grocery store chain. But, but Apple's amazing, and the Apple stores are amazing. And Johnson was the guy that built those. So all the articles say, oh, wow, he's the guy that did the Apple stores. What will he do with J.C. Penney? No, that is part of the story, but a bigger part of the story is Ron Johnson's a guy who went to Harvard Business School, got out, and went to work for Target. So he's my kind of guy because I'm a retailer. So he goes to work for Target. He spends 18 years there, and he works himself, works his way up to the very top. He wasn't the CEO, chief executive officer. He was like, the, depending on how you count, the number three person or whatever. He was in charge of the merchandising, picking the goods, which I can make a strong case. That's the most important job outside the CEO in any great retail company. Anyway, so when I look at this guy, I don't see the Apple guy. I do see that, but what I see is the Target guy. And he was playing a key role at Target in the 1990s when they were really at their strongest. And he was a key person there. A lot of the Target that we know and love is a result of him. So, you know, I see a Target guy who learned the basics of retailing. How do you stay in stock on socks, you know? Those kind of really big, important things. Not who are you buying or selling or something that makes headlines. How are you running your store every day? He learned it from one of the best retail companies in America, Target. And he took those lessons and in a radically different environment helped create the Apple stores and really created them working with Steve Jobs. Well, now back at JCPenney, it's a lot more like Target than it is like Apple stores. He's not going to control all the factories and what he makes and the design of every product he sells and the huge profit margins that Apple's been able to get on their products. So he's really in a lot of ways going home. But, uh, but understanding that gives me a much clearer view of who this guy is and where his head's at and combining the two and thinking, well, gosh, if I spent 18 years at Target and 10 years at Apple, well, what would I learn? I would learn a lot more about the consumer experience in a way at Apple. A lot more about everyday average people, the average American at Target, and how you might bring that together. And, and we'll see. Time will tell how it turns out at JCPenney. I, I believe he has a very high chance of making it succeed, but it'll be very tough. He'll make a lot of mistakes, and it will take years. But in any case, well, I don't care what company or what industry you're analyzing, if you don't think about it that way and think about the people. And so when you're looking into a company, Talk to people. Talk to people that work there now, no matter what level. Do they like it or not? And they have to be careful about anecdotes. Don't believe everything you hear. You know, I've met people working for the greatest of companies, Southwest Airlines or Whole Foods Market, who, who didn't really like it that much and left. Most great companies are not for everybody. Some of them are almost a cult. We'll come back and talk about that. But talk to a number of people. Get a sense of, you know, are they a hard working organization? Are they all about brains? Are they all about um, good service or just great products? Or is it just about design and how things look? Or, you know, and, and, and a great group to talk to, people to talk to, are people who used to work there. People who competed with the company. People who sell to the company. If I really want to understand the trends in the restaurants in a city, I would like to talk to a Cisco salesperson. Cisco is a great American company based in Houston that uh, supplies products to restaurants, ketchup and mustard and napkins and whatever. A great company. Now, there's another one uh, with a C that's in technology, another great company. But this one, they're all over the United States. Um, and. And whoever the Cisco salesperson is that calls on the restaurants in your town, they know about them. They know I can ask them and say, well, who's the smartest restaurateur in town? Who's the one that's the most innovative? Who do you think which one is the best one to work for? All the kind of questions I'm going to be asking. And I'll tell you that, what's the best one to work for? I'm going to come back and talk more about that later in the course. But that's another thing. It's the human side. So an uh, overarching idea, a big idea to apply to everything I'm going to be talking about is the idea of think of it, remember it, and remember to think of it as a human enterprise, as it's just people. 
just people. I mean, you know, Einstein, Michael Jordan, you know, FDR, they were just people. So not belittling people, but they are. They're humans. They put their skirt on once at a time, uh, something like that, one leg at a time, you know. Anyhow, remember that because a lot of people don't remember that and it causes them to misunderstand companies and how they work. I'll see you next class.